three of your. Oh, good. Well, I hope someone out. would. But I, I, the, th the third one is what really interests me. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, on, on abstinence, it sounded as though you pointed out that the data show that, that the study said that abstinence plus birth control seems to be the most effective program. So yeah. I think you don't have a quarrel with abstinence as a component. Scientifically. Oh, absolutely not. No, no. Right. It'd be silly. And the second one, missile mm -hmm. defense, you, I think you made the statement that there is no workable missile defense system. And I'm, I'm not sure you would want to make such a... What do you mean? A, well, what, what, what are you talking about? Well, the, uh, the notion of, 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 in, of spending money on a program to find out whether it can work. You don't have a quarrel with that, right? Uh, so I don't have a quarrel with, it, with spending money uh, on a program that has a reasonable likelihood of working, yeah. But, um, in fact... Um, uh, if you, uh, I mean, if you want to go into the tech technical problems, I think you could argue that there are much better ways to spend our defense dollars. But I don't have, I mean, research and development is not a problem from of mine, and I think, you know, we have a lot of money, and... Um, so this is just a deployment that you argue with. Yeah, I think you shouldn't deploy something unless it works. Right. Just okay. a little but set of character stage, thing. you're fine with you're fine. Well, In principle, although I would argue it, that an honest debate about this would argue that there are, in fact, better ways to spend our money than on missile defense. I'd rather spend our money on, on making our ports more safe, for example. I think it's a much better, and it's much less money than the $10 billion we spend against this threat that I claim doesn't exist. Okay? So I think an informed discussion would argue that research and development could be spent a lot better on other things. But I have no problem with research and development and defense issues, no. Okay. And the, uh, the, the third one, ID, there, that's kind of a, a no-brainer. I think you, you, you've definitely got that down. But on the question of, you, you, your argument was that that debate over evolution affects our economy and our quality of life. Now, the, my problem with that is you cited two, two data points that seem to me to contradict that. One is that clearly the scientific journals don't take the debate seriously, so it's not a problem no. in science. Secondly, even the president, who supposedly doesn't believe in evolution, when it comes time to actually apply it to something like bird flu, does so. So that isn't, isn't the whole quarrel over evolution basically a little fairy tale that we tell ourselves that does not have any consequences for applying the theory of evolution broadly when it matters? No, I think, look, I think there's a lot, there's some sense to what you said. Um, evolution, it's, in fact, there are well, I, I get letters from people who are doctors say, you know, I don't believe in theory of evolution, but I can handle patients, you know. And it's true that you can not believe something fundamental about science and still go on and, and behave, because people are amazing the way they can have two contradictory beliefs in their mind. In fact, most of us wouldn't be able to exist if we didn't, probably. But what worries me more is the public acceptance of agnosticism about something. If we, if we publicly say it's okay to undermine some fundamental and profoundly important science, the basis of modern biology, in our public statements, in our popular statements, what message does that give? And if we say, I'm, a, I'll be more explicit, if we say I'm agnostic about the age of the earth, that implies that you're putting your beliefs above the empirical data. And that's the message I don't think we need to give to people, because I've seen, and I would argue, we've seen over and over, and particularly in the last 10 years, belief trump empirical data, and it's been to our to, uh, it's hurt all of us. And so, you're right. I think, you know, whether, I think evolution is a straw man in many places. It's, it's got a lot of emotional energy and it's got a lot of intensity. But uh, I would argue that the message it sends everyone, including students, is the wrong message. And at that level, at that very basic cultural level, it's extremely dangerous. Yeah? I'll get to you. Hi, Richard Williams from uh, George Mason University. I wonder if you'd like to comment on the fact that the pseudoscience isn't always necessarily benign, uh, particularly in the 1920s and 30s in Germany with eugenics and so forth. Well, I, I mean, ab absolutely. Pseudoscience is, uh, I mean, it, at, at, at its best, it's laughable. and its worst, it's extremely dangerous. And I would argue, I mean, I didn't think it was benign. I think my first example was a clear example of I don't, what I don't think is benign. I think absence only is pseudoscience at this point, and to require it because of some a priori moral judgment is, is uh, criminal. Yeah? After your previous examples, I'm curious about your take on global warming. <laughs> I, I have more slides on that, but I guess I'm not going to show them because I went on too long, but I'll, I'll, let me, I'll give you the, the short version. The, um, 
global warming is another example, uh, less so now than it was, of, a, of a, in my mind uh, at this point, well, a manufactured controversy in the last few years. Um, the data, and I, I, I had a lot of data to show you, and, and it is really remarkable how we can study the temperature of the Earth over the last 450,000 years. Um, and, well, you know, I, I, I guess I can't help it though, show data. What can I do? Okay. I'm just going to show you a little bit of data. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to skip this uh, tirade against the current administration, but I want to show, I mean, you've seen this because you saw Gore, some of these movies, but, but the important thing is we can, what is a really useful piece of data that didn't exist a decade ago is, is the ice cores in, in, the, in Antarctica, uh, allowing us to trace both the temperature of the Earth and its, the isotopic abundance back 450,000 years and probe the temperature of the Earth and the, and the greenhouse gases and actually use physics to try and calculate it, try and make predictions for what, for what, what, uh, uh, what, what those climate changes should be. And the point is, it's really kind of amazing how well we can do. And the important thing is that during that same period, that same period, we can also measure sea levels. And the sea levels varied by plus or minus 80 meters. We're not talking inches. And I want to you know, go back to this data here. We are living in a time that is unprecedented that has not the same as the planet. We are living in a different planet than has existed in the last 500,000 years. And it is absolutely true that we cannot predict what the future will be. We can make models that have levels of uncertainty. But one thing is clear, is that we are living in a different world. A world where all of the arguments suggest not only that global warming will happen, but sea level rise will happen. And in fact, if you look at uh, uh, at the sea level rise in, in Greenland, in particular the, the melting of the uh, Greenland ice sheets, it's far faster than the models predict. And, and the important thing about all of this is, is probably this, is the fact that all of the models suggest, and there's a great diversity in what they predict, but they all say we can't afford to wait to 2020 or 2030 to act. And so the point is, independent of your concerns, this, when you, you will remember when this administration went to the Supreme Court and fought against the EPA being able to reg regulate greenhouse gases. They made two statements, two of which I, I would argue are false. One is that, have, that trying to regulate greenhouse gases would have a negative effect on our economy. I don't know, who, who, those are the same people who are, we're supposed to talk about American enterprise. It seems to me the great chance we have as a highly technological nation is to lead the world in, in finding new technological solutions to this problem. And one example is ozone. We solved that problem in a decade without destroying, I mean, it may have hurt the refrigerator industry uh, for a while, but it didn't much. But the other problem is that there's, that because of the quote unquote scientific uncertainty, we shouldn't act. And I think the point is that models are models, and I have no, I have complete agreement with the fact that there's uncertainties. But business as usual should not, when you look at those models, be viable. There's, there's no good argument to wait to 2020 to act, because if you do, all the models argue that incredible damage is likely to, been res to result to that. And so, so the point, my argument is, I think most people are arguing, and we hear it from both sides of the aisle, that global warming is a problem. But what we don't hear people are saying, we, ha we, we actually have to do something about it in the near term, that we can wait to deal with it for the next administration or, to, or for our children, and we can't. Okay, that's my statement of global warming. Yeah? Oh, hi, I'm Kevin Finner, and I'm the editor of Issues in Science and Technology at the National Academy of Sciences. Um, my question is, what are things that scientists say that make them sound like idiots? Um, well, I what, what, I said some, some, but... some of these, <laughs> I mean, what are the things that you think the science community does that, you know, cause some problems for themselves? Oh, Wait, sure. ways which they go wrong, which make this debate and, and the separation of science and anti-science more, more tr troublesome okay. than it should be. Oh, sure. Well, I'll give you one clear example that I was going to talk about. Uh, you almost planted, um, as you were. Uh, um, scientists, many scientists make the following statement. There is no evidence for God. And then they make the statement, there is no God. And that is one example of what's caused a lot of this problem and why a lot of the people, and a lot of the people that I've debated who are quite earnest, who view science as dangerous, who view science as requiring you not to believe in God, because a lot of scientists say that. 